Uh, we're going to start today's chapel service by taking what is known as a mindful pause. We began this practice a couple of weeks ago by sitting still and listening to the sound of the singing bell or bowl. Do you remember that? We're going to do that again today, but we're going to add another step. And that is an awareness of our breathing. Breathing in and out is something that our bodies do automatically. So we rarely stop to realize it or take notice of it. But when we consciously focus our attention onto our breathing, the effect of that is that we give our brains a break from its usual busy thoughts of homework, sports practices, meetings, writing comments, answering emails, and so on. Research has shown, scientific research has shown, that when we take even a moment of mindful awareness, we give our bodies, our, our own body's parasympathetic nervous system, a chance to engage. We have a sympathetic nervous system and a parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic one is the one that keeps us going about all the things we have to do. But if we can put that on hold, then in rushes the parasympathetic nervous system. Now, when that happens, our breathing slows down, our heart rate lowers, our moods, our moods, how we feel, actually lift, and our immune system, even in that moment, is strengthened. So taking brief moments of mindfulness can actually add hours of efficiency and good health and well-being to our busy days. This is very counterintuitive, I know. The idea is when you're feeling stressed, keep working harder to get over it. Sometimes that's a good idea, but often it's not. And the more people are learning about this in business and athletics, the more it is catching on. It's actually a very ancient, ancient practice. There's nothing new about it other than we are now becoming more aware of it. So we're going to give this a try today. So first of all, I would like for you to sit up straight and rest your left hand, your left hand comfortably on your left thigh. With your right elbow resting by your side, not sticking out like this, rest it comfortably in your lap and rest your right hand somewhere on your belly. Now then, as you breathe in slowly, notice your right hand moving a bit as your belly expands as you inhale and contracts as you exhale. If you find that your hand isn't moving much, it may be because you're breathing into your chest your chest area instead of your belly. It takes a little bit of a consciousness to shift that breathing down deeper. So see if you can breathe down into your stomach area in such a way that your hand moves up and down as you breathe. All right, here's what to expect. I'm going to ring the singing bell one time. I'd like you to listen for the tone even as it fades away. After it does so, we will have one minute of pure silence. In that moment, try to focus on your breathing or on the movement of your hand on your belly. Now, if you hear somebody shift in their seat or sneeze or cough, just notice it to yourself by saying, hmm, that was a cough. So noted. And then bring your attention back to your own breath. At the end of the one minute, I will ring the bell again. And as the tone fades away again, and as you feel ready to do so, open your eyes again. Now, as I said, this is an ancient spiritual practice that is not particularly hard, but it does take discipline. That's the reason it's called a practice, is because it takes practice. So please be respectful of those around you by not looking at anyone not making eye contact with anyone else during this exercise. The best thing to do is either to close your eyes or to soften your gaze on the floor, someplace on the floor in front of you. Okay, now that we're ready. <coughs> so, 
So as you feel ready, open your eyes and look up. Look up. Try to hold on to that silence and look at the colors of the leaves. Notice the brilliant blue of the sky behind me. Welcome to this amazing moment in time. You are present. You are right here in body, mind, and spirit, exactly where you need to be. Well done, grasshoppers. Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to share with you a little bit of perspective on our journey so far. As Mr. Newbold announced yesterday, we are now one-sixth of the way through our school year. We have accepted the call to adventure and have set off on our journey together. Most of us have established a good pace and are feeling okay about our progress so far. But is anyone still starting to feel like that flat path is beginning to come, is beginning to, <laughs> excuse me. Is anyone starting to feel like that flat path is beginning to head up uphill? Any journey worth taking will present some challenges. And when it does, we turn to our mentors and brothers for wisdom, encouragement, and guidance. Today we will kick off this week's theme, which is honesty, and speaking on behalf of the mentors is Mr. Shriver. Please join me in welcoming him now. Thank you, Jalen, and good afternoon, everyone. It's an honor and a pleasure to be speaking before all of you today on a subject that I think is really important, and that's honesty. And I think for many of us who highly value honesty, we discover its importance, let's say, the hard way. I'd like to share the following story with you. Believe it or not, it's gonna have nothing to do with music, but instead centers around something that many of us are a little bit familiar with, and that's ninth grade biology. When I was in ninth grade, biology was not my favorite class. The simple reason was I didn't understand it. I couldn't tell a mitochondria from a midichlorian. I think that last one gives you Jedi powers. My biology teacher, Mrs. Meyer, was a really traditional teacher in her methods. Um, she gave us notes, we took notes. She gave us homework, we did homework. She gave us tests and quizzes in labs, we did tests and quizzes in labs. Not a lot of variation. Now when the end of term came, I wanted desperately, my very first term, to be on the honor roll. Okay, let's be honest, I wanted the privileges that came with being on honor roll. And I was pretty sure I needed to get a 90 in biology if I was gonna make honor roll. So the last day of the term came, and at the end of biology class, Mrs. Meyer, on little tiny slips of paper, handed out to each person their grade on a folded up little slip of paper. People started opening their papers, saw some smiling faces, and then I opened mine and it said 88.7. So I decided to do what some people in this room may have done uh, if you've gotten a grade that, not the grade that you wanted, I went to my teacher during study hall to see if there was any way that I could get that last 1.3 points and make honor roll. When I got to study hall, Mrs. Meyer had told me that I had done pretty well on tests and quizzes and labs, but on my homework I had three zeros. Now this came as a bit of a nasty shock because uh, I took it as a point of pride at that time that I always did my homework, even if I didn't like it, even if I didn't like the subject matter, I always did my homework. So my first instinct was to blame the teacher. Of course I had handed in my homework, she just lost it. Now to understand Mrs. Meyer, you have to know three things. The first one was that she was one of the most proudly disorganized people I have ever known. The second is that she had one of the most epic piles, not one of, many of, the most epic piles of student work heaped around her classroom that I've ever seen. We're talking this high, and I'm serious, we're talking this high. Um, Third, by the time I got to biology class in ninth grade, Mrs. Meyer had been teaching at that school 26 years. She used to joke about the fact that she'd had some of our parents in her class, and I think some of them were not jokes. Um, so when I told Mrs. Meyer that of course she just must have lost my homework and she please give me credit so I could get my 90, um, rather than correct my rudeness or be angry at my presumption, she just smiled. She pointed to the pile of papers behind her and said, that's every single homework that I've collected from your class this term. If your homework is in there, it means you handed it in. If it's not in there, it means you didn't. So I began to look through the pile of papers once, twice. Got all the way through twice with nothing. 
So I went back across the room to my biology notebook and started looking through that. And there it was, one of my zero homeworks, sitting done in my biology notebook. And then I looked at the due date, September 24th. It was six weeks overdue. Well, I said she's not going to give me credit for six weeks overdue. Um, and I was pretty sure if I could get credit on one of those three, I could get the, get the 90 that I was after. So then I got an idea. I visited Mrs. Meyer's classroom when it was full of students who had come to get her help. There was about 20 people in the room all together. So I walked over to the big stack of papers behind her and I began to look through a third time. But in my other hand was the homework that I had done, done in my hand, and I just looked through and about halfway through, I slipped the paper in and voila, there's my homework. Mrs. Meyer, see, it's been here the whole time. I uh, guess you just must have missed it. So she looked, so I put it down on her desk. She looked down at the homework. She looked back at me. She said very definitively, this homework didn't come from that pile. I froze. I'm thinking, there is no way that she can know what every single paper in that pile can be, but she's really sure that this didn't come from there. So I said, what do you mean? I, I just pulled it out of the pile. And I, I had just pulled it out of the pile right after I put it there. You see, she began, when someone turns, to these, uh, when someone turns in an assignment, I take one of these dead pens out of my desk and I put an line across the front. There's no ink in the pen, but you can still see the impression where the pen was. That's how I stay organized and give credit for the assignments that have been turned in on time. But yours has no imprint, therefore it didn't come from that pile. She had me. I was done. There was nothing more than I could do. So she turned to me, she looked at me in the eye, and she said, I'm going to ask you again, where did you get this? What could I do? I swallowed hard, I took a deep breath, and I told the truth. I pulled it out of my notebook, I said. I really did have it done on time, but I must have forgotten to turn it in. So she looked at me for a moment and she said, I believe you. I believe you did it on time. I believe you forgot to turn it in. When the time finally came, you did tell the truth. So I'm going to give you credit. In the end, I got my 90. I made honor roll. Today I couldn't even tell you what the missing homework was on except something about biology. But what I was left with from that day to this day was the lesson that Mrs. Meyer had given me about honesty and it has guided my actions ever since. Thank you. As we move towards Parents Weekend and Fall Break, we may feel tired and tempted to cut corners, not only in the walking paths, but in our teams, in our classes, and in our dorms. When the things get tough, it is wise to rely upon our brothers, on each other, because when we feel weak, our friends can help us be strong. I am pleased to welcome the student who is speaking on behalf of the brothers today, Suleiman Balo. Good afternoon, Mr. and Ms. McCusker, faculty, and Cardigan brothers. Honesty is one of the words we hear very often through our lives. We heard, we heard it way before we arrived here on the point. We will continue to hear it after we leave. That's because honesty is such as living a good life. And no matter where or when you are leaving, it's such as living a good life, no matter where or when you're leaving. <laughs> as you know, here at Cardigan, honesty is one of our core values. But just as it's such as living a good life in general, honesty is a key part of each of the other core values. For example, you can be compassionate by telling the truth the first time around. Or you can be fair to a faculty member by explaining honestly what happened in a certain scenario. You can also be respectful by telling the truth and social scholarship by being honest in the classroom or on the field. Cardigan Mountain School defines the, defines the core value of honesty as rigorously speaking the truth in all settings and dealings. This means telling the truth no matter what the circumstances are or consequences might be. At first, telling the truth no matter what might seem like it would be really hard to do. But believe it or not, it is easier living the cardigan way when you have nothing to worry about because you are honest all the time. As the American writer Mark Twain said, if you tell the truth all the time, you don't have to remember anything. Honesty is a key to earning other people's trust. It is very hard to earn trust in life and it's even harder to gain it back once you lose it. 
Let me tell you a story about one time when I was caught not being honest. I know, it's hard. The world don't end, it's okay. When I was 10, I broke my dad's favorite watch. I was playing catch with it and I accidentally dropped it and it broke. I quickly hit it, thinking that my dad wouldn't find it, but eventually he did. When he asked me if I knew what happened, I lied and told him that I had no clue. He eventually found out and I was in a lot of trouble. I served consequences and learned a lesson. He then told me that if I simply told the truth from the beginning, he would have not cared as much and would have forgiven me. My integrity was more valuable to him than any other watch in the world. One of the many rewards for being honest is forgiveness. Your family, peers, and teachers understand that life is full of mistakes. Everybody makes them, but mistakes always turn out better if you can tell the truth. The consequences after telling the truth about a mistake will be 10 times better than the consequences after lying about a mistake. Believe it or not, I have a second story about a time when I was less honest. I remember when I asked my teacher for a rubber band to wrap around my pen. I thought she was smart enough to realize my intentions, but apparently she wasn't. When she walked out of the classroom, I was aiming at a fellow friend, ready to take his head off. Unfortunately, she walked right back, right back in when I was about to release, and she snatched the rubber band right out of my hand. From then on, I can remember her every time I asked for school supplies. Now you might think after these experiences, I would have learned my lesson, but no. Just last year here at school, I was using an internet proxy server, which is clearly against the rules. Eventually, Mr. Harris found out. My Cardinal brothers and I felt guilty, and, om and almost all of us confessed. We actually felt better for having done so rather than trying to hide the truth. Hiding the truth can make you feel like a jerk. Some of you may recall that early last year in our own cardigan community, somebody thought it, was, it would be funny to draw inappropriate graffiti in the woman's locker room. It wasn't funny. And as a result of the person not coming for her to tell the truth about what he did, the whole school had to sit in the dining hall after dinner and do nothing until it was time for study hall. As far as I know, the truth never came out. But I know for a fact, the person who did it felt bad. He probably just thought that telling the truth would get him in more trouble than hiding it. The problem with this decision though, was he got all of his carding brothers in trouble because he wasn't brave enough to tell the truth about what he had done. Being honest is a good thing. You can earn a good reputation by being honest. Being honest means you are trustworthy. You can gain the trust of faculty members as well as family and friends. I personally think that being honest is the most important aspect of a healthy relationship. Cardigan is a small, close-knit community. It is very hard to get away with a lie. Whenever you lie, the word spreads. Do you know how it is? One kid tells his friends and they tell others. Eventually an adult found out and the action you thought you could get away with comes back to bite you in the butt. Plus, every person along the way now thinks of you as someone who lies about stuff, so they won't be able to trust you. So brothers, please take them from me. Whenever you lie, the truth comes out one way or another, and you will regret your decision to lie forever. And even if your lie manages to stay hidden, you'll regret it even more. That's because an undiscovered lie stays with you, eating away at your soul, chipping away at your confidence, and eating your soul. It just isn't worth it. Remember boys, honesty is the best policy. Thank you. Oh, my God.
for the benediction today. We'll do it once in Hebrew, once in English. Give a recha, and I will give you a recha. Yeah, Ere, and I will have a letter. Be Kuneka. Be Sarah, and I will have a letter. Be a saint, and I will have a shaman. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you. 